I did this last year with 23 books to read in 23 and I've actually done pretty well. I only have two books left to read on there which is The Sin Eater by Megan Campisi and uh, Imperium by Rajab Kapuscinski and I'm off over Christmas so hopefully I will manage to get through them. Um, but I th next year is 2024 so we're doing 24 books for 2024. I don't know if I will just keep going up, I might have to go back to like 12 books for the year um, but this is two a month and I think that's probably the maximum. I'm going to manage to do. Keeping the list front and centre on my Notion was very useful for me. Um, I will leave setting up my reading Notion video that I made in the cards above if you want to go and see how I did that but it was kind of in the middle the list of the 23 books I wanted to read last year and that definitely made me go for it. When I make this list it is always books that I already own um, whether that is I own the physical copy um, these books here or I own them in audio or ebooks. Obviously I plan to read books that are coming out next year and some other things will end up on my TBR um, either through hearing people talk about them or um, through discoveries of my own. Um, so I'm not lim I'm not only going to read 24 books next year fingers crossed touch wood and all that um, but I am definitely planning to read these ones so we should probably get into it. Um, I'll start with the physical ones then we'll go into a digital since the physical ones are right next to me. The one on the top of my pile is um, Lao Shea's Mr Ma and Son. Uh, this is a classic, a one of these mint classics from Penguin, Penguin Modern Classics. Um, I always seem drawn to these and pick them up. They have quite a range of uh, like international classics, translated classics, um, which is something that I am interested in reading. Expanding our idea of what is considered a classic and the canon, um, so reading things outside of the UK-US context. Um, although this one I think is set in London, um, but it is by uh, Lao Shi, who was a Chinese writer. Um, and it is about Mr Ma and his son, who are immigrants to London in the 1920s. And they struggle with money and misunderstandings of English and like getting to know English culture. And there is the overbearing patronage of a reverend who is trying to be like a missionary to them. So I think it is kind of a look at Englishness and English culture, particularly in the early 20th century, like height of the British Empire kind of Britishness from the perspective of people who have uh, emigrated there. So it is a moving, it says it's a moving portrayal of the Chinese immigrant experience and a satire of um, the English. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to reading that. I think uh, most of the immigrant narratives that I have read are immigrants to the US, um, which makes sense considering it is like more, there are a lot of immigrants into England as well, but um, like it's obviously more part of the national identity in the US. Um, but so it will be good to, to read one about immigration to the UK that's not like 20th century child of immigrant narrative, which I have read quite a lot of. So yeah, I'll be interested to read this. Then the other one that is a teal classic, or mint classic that I have picked up and actually I have read the beginning of in a trial chapter tag. Again I'll leave that in the cards above and have enjoyed the writing of. Um, this is Seasons of Migration to the uh, North by Tayyip Saleh who is a Sudanese writer which actually um, you may have been hearing a lot about Sudan in the news lately because there is currently an ongoing civil war in Sudan and also a um, pos potential genocide of a in Darfur, which would be the second genocide in Darfur as it happened in the 90s I believe as well. Um, and so that is currently ongoing. I will leave information in the description, links to places where you can provide support if that is something you are interested in doing. I'm actually considering reading more books from areas of conflict so that I can also talk about the current conflicts. Um, so perhaps next year I will be reading Palestinian, Congolese and Sudanese authors for example. This one is translated from Arabic and it is about a man who has gone to England and has got an education there and has come back to his small town um, kind of having an idea of himself as the most worldly person in this small town only to discover that a new person has turned up who is called Mustafa and he um, whilst he seems like he is a normal part of the town he discovers that he that he has some sort of past and has both a British passport and a Sudanese passport um, and is about to tell him his story that's as far as I got he's going to tell how he became involved this is from the 1960s I think first appeared in Arabic in 1966 so it's a bit more recent The Colour Purple by Alice Walker this is obviously also a modern classic and one that I have yet to read I think 
in America, lots of people study it in school, um, but it is not a common text here in the same way. Um, but it's definitely one that I've heard a lot about and that I need to get to. Um, and it was on the BBC's 100 books that shaped our world. So even if it's not as commonly read here in schools, it's still well known. One sister is forced into an abusive marriage, but their father was also violent. And so she brings her sister in with her. And it is epistolary, it is told through letters, which is interesting. Um, I haven't read many books that are told that way, but I do enjoy it. I think you can tell so much about a character by the way that they write. Um, and this was first published in the 1980s, 1983. Then we have um, an English an English Guide to Birdwatching by Nicholas Royal. And this is one that I discovered or, or rediscovered on my shelves when I was doing a clear out recently, um, it, it, which again, I'll be linked in the cards above. It is one that I was considering getting rid of because um, I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about this. I had no idea what it was about, but then I read the back and I was suddenly entranced. Um, it's about Silas and Ethel Woodlock who retire from their business of undertaking to spend their twilight years by the sea. Um, but things are not as easy as they hoped and it's all to do with herring gulls. Journalist Stephen Osmer is writing a dangerously provocative essay about so social justice and the banking crisis, as well as a diatribe about two people called Nicholas Royal, one a novelist and the other a literary cri critic. critic. Lily Lynch is pursuing more than an art project about cin cinematic intentions. It combines a page-turning story about literary theft, adultery and ambition with The Hides, a poetic and moving investigation into our relationship with birds and the environment. It talks about linguistic playfulness and formal invention, pushing the boundaries of what a novel might be. Um, and it was that sort of thing that talked about um, the inventiveness of it and the look at form and things that really intrigued me. Although, just looking through it, you can't see that. I'm sure I saw, I just saw a bookmark. It doesn't appear to be in there. Anyway, it's one that I hadn't heard anything about um, and I'm trying to read all my books as you can tell. Not from an author that I've read twice but both of them years ago in my late teens and early twenties. We have Wise Children by Angela Carter. I have read The Bloody Chamber and um, Nights at the Circus by Angela Carter and I loved it. I think she's one of the people that got me to note, like, that first awakened my interest in kind of visceral, gory, strange, um, fantastical bit fairy tale esque but not fairy tale retellings, although The Bloody Chamber is a fairy tale retelling, but gory whimsy <laughs> that I have really enjoyed in the past. Um, so I definitely want to read this book as well. Um, and this is about two theatrical families, The Hazards and The Chances, and a bawdy novel populated with as many sets of twins and mistaken identities as any Shakespearean co comedy and celebrates the magic of over a century of show business. Um, since Nights at the Circus was also revolved around show business and um, the idea of being on stage and the theatricalness, um, I think that will be, uh, and I really enjoyed that, I think that will be interesting and yeah I want to get back into I love her prose. Then we have uh, Gabrielle Garcia Marquez, Love in the Time of Cholera. I have read 100 Years of Solitude, I absolutely love 100 Years of Solitude and so this is his other kind of really well-known book. Um, there actually is a new Marquez coming out next year, even though he's dead, um, because there was a lost novel that was discovered and has now been translated, um, so that's called something in April. I'm looking forward to reading that but I also want to read Love in the Time of Cholera. This one is about a man who was in love with a woman but she married someone else and he loved her from afar for years although he did get into other dalliances with other people um, and then one day at the beginning of the novel her husband dies and we see if that love can be rekindled like 50 years later um, and I think it's also like Mark has another look at um, the history and politics of uh, Latin American nations particularly Colombia. Um, as Marquez's work often is, um, and magical realist and decadent and kind of gross, um, which again, things I love. The two big chunky novels that I want to read this year are both by writers that I have read and loved before, um, and that is The Lacuna by Barbara Kingsolver and The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. Now, in terms of The Goldfinch, I read The Secret History about 10 years ago now, so it's a bit more hit and miss whether I actually like her writing or whether like whether my taste has changed and I've moved on how I would feel about the secret history as someone in her early 30s as opposed to someone in her early 20s. I, this is an experiment to see whether I would still vibe with Donna Tartt. Um, this is about a boy, this is about an art theft I think, about a boy Theo Decker who miraculously survives a catastrophe that otherwise tears his life apart. 
Alone and rudderless in New York, he is taken in by the family of a wealthy friend. Fear is tormented by a longing for his mother, and down the years he clings to the thing that most reminds him of her, a small, captivating painting that ultimately draws him into the criminal underworld. Okay, maybe it's not, maybe the painting wasn't stolen. I don't know much about it, obviously. Um, but it is done at art. It was a number one international bestseller and shortlisted for the Women's Prize. Not everybody loves it but it's definitely one that people talk about. Um, so I'm interested in reading it myself. Barbara Kingsolver, on the other hand, uh, again, similarly, I read her the first book I read of hers, which was the Poisonwood Bible, when I was about 16 or 17. But then I read the second book of hers, for me to read, by, which was Demon Copperhead um, last year and uh, this year, this year. And I absolutely loved that one as well. So I know I still love her work. She also writes really chunky novels, um, but more in a, I feel like place is really important for Barbara Kingsolver. Out of the books that I read and the background of this one as well, she definitely is grounded in a certain specific place. This one is Mexico in the 1930s um, and it is about a man who is working in the household of uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo and I think that Lev Trotsky is also there. He's always an observer recording his experiences in diaries and notebooks. When exiled Bol Bolshevik leader Lev Trotsky arrives, Shepard inadvertently casts in his lot with art and revolution. So politics and history and art um, said Mexico. I actually am going to Mexico in February so maybe I'll take this chunky one with me. Maybe I'll just read some Mexican authors when I'm out there. Not sure, but I will I will be there. So, right, a proof that I've had for ages since March 2022, so we're coming up on two years, is here again now by Ukachukwu Nzelu, which I also read in that Tri Chapter tag. I read the first um, 35 or so pages of this book. This is a contemporary novel set in between London and Manchester about two boys who have been friends since they were very young, and they are both from Nigerian immigrant families, um, and they have been having like a sexual romantic relationship with one another, but they are not quite ready to commit to one another or well, one is and one isn't although not because of feelings about his sexuality because he's had relationships with other men anyway and then the one who is ready to commit his father comes to stay with them for a while who is an alcoholic and a homophobic man um, and it is a look at identity and sickness and family um, as I've had the proof for so long I feel like I should finally get to it I'm going to try and read more of my proofs this year if I request any I'm going to actually try and read them and not leave them sitting on my shelf for two years. Little Sons by Zaka Zumda is the one that I said in that tri chapter tag that I was going to read by the end of this year um, but I am halfway through five books um, none of which is this one and so I don't think I'm actually going to make it unfortunately so it needs to be at the top of my list to read next year. Uh, this one is set in South Africa in the early 20th century about a man who has, he's walking for ages and he is disabled um, and he comes across a family who take him from the road and they take him to his, his house and he is looking for a specific woman but he doesn't know her name he just knows which like nation she comes from. She was working at the uh, fort um, but the assassination of uh, the colonial person in charge um, Hope tore them apart um, and he is trying to get back to her and I think we're going to go flashback in time to see what happened uh, what, when that magistrate was uh, assassinated. So another piece of historical fiction set this time in South Africa and I enjoyed the first chapter so much so I definitely need to get on with reading it. And then finally for physical books I have one non-fiction. This is Empire Land by Santham Sengera, How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. I have read books about British imperialism such as History of Violence um, and various others set in specific countries. What's the one by Shashi Thiru? Uh That was about the British in India but I've read other ones but this one is much more about Britain, contemporary Britain today and how the empire that it ran for four centuries that then um, dissolved in the 1960s um, how that affects modern Britain, the way British people view the world and also the way that it is structured and run and the way that we shy away from looking at empire, we keep it as a symbol rather than understanding it truly for what it was. Um, so yes, I am interested to read that, to look into that because it is a different perspective on empire. I've talked before here, uh, my family is Irish, my mum is Northern Irish, I Northern Irish Irish rather than Northern Irish British um, and so I have have a specific understanding of empire from that perspective but um it's always good to read it more broadly one of the audiobooks that i want to listen to this year is east of eden by john steinbeck which is obviously an american classic and it is about two families whose fates are interlinked i believe it is uh, kind of loosely based on the cain and abel 
uh, myth from the Bible. Um, and it is about two families in California's valley over the generations from the beginning of the 20th century through the First World War, a, like a true Americana novel, one that's uh, very well loved and kind of an idea of how the Americans read themselves is kind of an interesting way to look at it. I think it also maybe goes into the Dust Bowl or at least the early start of the Dust Bowl. Um, it's a period of American history that I haven't read a huge deal amount, deal about, um, and would like to read more of and reading it from one such like very well-known uh, storied writer, the American canon. Um, I'm looking forward to giving it a go. In an entirely different tack we have Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell uh, by Susanna Clarke, although this is also a very big book, um, and I think it was shortlisted or longlisted, something for the man booker, which as it is fantasy, genre fiction, uh, isn't that common. So um, I'm looking forward to giving that a go. This one is set in 1806, so it's the uh, Georgian period in London, and it is about scholars who study magic and discover that like one m practical magician still exists. Um, and that's Mr. Norrell, and then he's challenged by a newbie, Jonathan Strange. And a battle emerges between the two men during like no Napoleonic Wars, so it's like mirroring the battles between England and France. Obviously the title gives Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde vibes, which is also a Victorian novel, so a little later than this is set. That kind of two sides of the same coin rivalry situation. And it is a really, really well-loved fantasy novel. Um, I'm going to see if I, I get into it. I'm not really a fantasy reader. I also want to read the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. So this is one that I want to read because I've heard so many great things about it. I think Honoré Fanon Jeffers is a poet and I like uh, novels written by poets, that's something that I like to explore. However it is also a historical fiction novel that spans generations which I have talked about not liking despite their popularity in the past. Um, so we'll see how this one works for me. I've just heard so many good things that I'm really intrigued by it. It's about a family that's growing up in Georgia, a black family growing up in Georgia, and the, the history, the ghosts of the past haunt the woman in present day, she hears their voices. And you know how much I love a literary ghost story. And so she looks into her own personal history, uh, discovers things about her family, which is why I think I might like it more than ones that just go chronologically. And I definitely am intrigued by it because of the ghosts. I just love ghosts. Now the next one I believe is pronounced Aoe uh, by Becky Manawatu and it is one that I have had, I had it as a art from NetGalley just before it came out and I didn't read it in time but I do now have the audiobook of it as well and I need I need to get round to it. Um, it is a, a uh, Becky Manawatu is a Maori author so this is set in Aotearoa. Aoe is like a howl of anguish and this is about a boy who loves the sea and music but also about gang violence which killed his father and this is a coming of age novel about a young Maori boy um, and his friends and their dog and his brother. Um, so I am, I don't, I haven't read that much Maori fiction. I did read, I did do a reading vlog a few years ago where I was reading books by uh, Australian and Aotearoa indigenous authors. So I have read I think two books by uh, Maori authors before but definitely something I need to read more of. Another one that I want to read is Ovid's Heroides. Uh, I have talked before on this channel about how I have a classics degree and I did my dissertation on Ovid's Metamorphoses but I haven't read his Heroides which is kind of a Greek myth retelling from the perspective of a Roman writing it um, which I think will be interesting. So he writes in Herodes it's about the heroines from Greek myths and he writes letters or like speeches told from heroines of Greek myths. Um, so like Ariadne and um, Metamnestra. Um, I'm not sure all of the ones that are in there but I definitely want to read more classics again. Uh, this year I read the Aeneid and um, last year I read the Odyssey. I do also have uh, Emily Wilson's translation of the Iliad, so maybe I will read that as well. But on my Kindle I've had the Heroides for years, since probably since I was at uni ten years ago. Um, but I haven't read it and I desperately want to. Another one that I want to read is My Brilliant Friend by um, Elena Ferrante. I know loads of people talk about it on booktube, particularly Renee from So I Read This Book, um, who I'll leave linked in the description. She did a whole like Ferrante video, I'm pretty sure, um, and I need to read the, the quartet, the, um, is it just the, my, no, the, it's the, Na the Neapolitan quartet, that's the one, the Neapolitan quartet. Um, my Brilliant Fred is the first one and it is set in the 1950s in Naples about two friends who have been friends since they were very young and I think they have like a love-hate relationship um, and it is uh, they're growing up in a poor neighbourhood in Naples in the um, 
after the Second World War. But I think their friendship, their relationship with one another is the, is the key to this whole quartet. Um, and people love it so much as a portrayal of female friendship. Um, so I definitely want to give it a go. Uh, another one I want to read is The Garden of Evening Mist by Tan Tuan Eng. Tan Tuan Eng was long listed for the booker this year, which is how I first heard of them. And The Garden of Evening Mists is the one that is like his best selling, best known novel. It is the one that was actually shortlisted for the booker in the past. Um, and I am intrigued and I want to read it. It's historical fiction, I believe. It's historical fiction, I believe, and set in Malaysia. Oh, there's someone at my door. So this is about two people in Malaya, as it was known, uh, during the Second World War. One who was the gardener for the Emperor of Japan, and one who was a woman whose sister was killed at the hand of the Japanese, and she wants him to help building a memorial for his, her sister. Um, but she has to discover her own past and how it is linked to the troubled history of Malaysia. As you know, historical fiction, particularly set outside of the UK US, is something that I love to read about. And since Tan Tuan Eng is supposed to be such a good writer of that genre, um, I want to read this one. Next is another author that I have read from before. I read How To Be Both by Ali Smith, and the one that I want to read is Autumn. I really enjoyed How To Be Both and the way that it played with like the form of the novel um, and the way that Ali Smith writes. I really enjoyed the style of the book um, and the kind of close internal uh, internal way that it was written from the like the head of the, the writer. Um, and obviously Ali Smith's court, seasonal quartet is what she is very well known for, and I do have the audiobook for this. I'm intrigued to know how well it will read not at the time because I think her seasonal quartet was very much set in the time that it was written. I believe that winter was like delayed a little bit because it had to be re- not winter, I believe that summer was delayed a little bit because it had to be rewritten to be about the pandemic. Um, whereas Autumn it came out in 2016 and is very much about the lead up to the Brexit referendum in the UK I think. But, but I, so I want to see how well it like held, holds up despite that specific time period and the description that you get for what it's actually about is so vague like it's like from Keatsian mists and mellow fruitfulness with the vitality and immediacy and the colour of hit of and the colour hit of pop art via a bit of skullduggery autumn is a witty excavation of the present by the past autumn is a take on popular culture and meditation in a world growing ever more bordered what constitutes richness and worth so like that tells me nothing <laughs> about the plot um so I don't think Ali Smith really relies that much on plot anyway, um, but I would like to give her writing another go. I also want to read Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keefe. Uh, it's a topic I'm interested in and an author that I've read from before. I've read um, The M Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe a couple of years ago, um, and I really, really loved his like intense research and his focus in terms of writing, amount of documentary evidence he gives you and I really really enjoyed that from him as a writer and I also think he does a really good job of combining that intense research and the lot of background with a story and a compelling narrative. Say Nothing is his history of the troubles in Northern Ireland and as I mentioned earlier my mum is from Derry um, in the North of Ireland and grew up there um, during the worst of the troubles in the 1970s. Part of my family history, um, but something that I don't know much about, like the broader look at. I know the like specific family history stories, um, like going to the Bloody Sunday Museum last time I was in Derry taught me a lot about the broader history um, of it. And so it's something that I want to research more and read more about. And as I like Patrick Redden Keefe's writing, and this is said to be such a great um, look at the story, uh, I am interested to give this one a go. We're actually into the non-fiction that I want to read that I own digitally now. The rest of these are all non-fiction. Uh, and one of those is The Economics of Inequality by Thomas Piketty. I have a feeling this one might be a bit too big brain for me. I have never studied economics um, and Thomas Piketty is a well-known French economist. Um, so having this on audiobook I feel like it might be a bit overwhelming. It is only a very short book so hopefully that will make it a little easier. And it is described in the back as being accessible so hopefully it will be for me because um, I haven't done maths since A-level. But I think that this one kind of is very clear what it is about from the beginning, the economics of inequality, how inequality is at the centre of our system and it is a feature, not a bug, it is intentionally there. Um, so I, yeah, to know more about the facts and the stats around that. In a similar vein we have The Establishment and How They Get Away With It by Owen Jones. I have seen Owen Jones talk a lot in online, I haven't actually seen him in person, but I've never read any of his books and I believe Chavs, The Demonization of the Working Class and The Establishment, How the 
rich get away with it are his two most well-known books um so i want to see if i get on with him as a writer this is about how the establishment uh get away with being so powerful and in control whilst being not acknowledged for that power and control from the lobbies of westminster to newsrooms and boardrooms i want to see how conspiracist this is how how much it is re reads like a global plan and just like the media having coming from a specific background specific place getting to knowing all sorts of different people warping the way that they choose to tell stories and the stories that they choose to tell this is about how that relates to democracy and the potential lack thereof in the uk next we have eating animals by jonathan safran fur i have read and enjoyed his fiction before but i haven't read any of his non-fiction and obviously this one is about eating animals. Um, I think it's from like a philo philosophical, sociological perspective um, about his being someone who ate meat and then having a child and thinking about the ways meat is produced, what meat means um, culturally and like why would he want to f feed his child meat? So he is a meat eater in this. Um, and so I'm interested to see that perspective. I used to be a vegetarian and no longer am. So uh, I don't cook meat, I don't order meat at restaurants, but I do occasionally eat it. And so it, it'll be an interesting for me um, because I think I bought this book before I went vegetarian and then I went vegetarian without reading it. Um, but I have since come back a little bit. So it will be an interesting thing for me to read. And the final book on my list is The Looting Machine by Tom Burgess. Its subtitle is Warlords, Tycoons, Smugglers and a System Systematic Theft of Africa's Wealth. And this was published in uh, 2016. So it is again a little bit older. Um, it won't be completely up to date but I think it goes quite a lot through the history of colonialism and neocolonialism and how we, um, extractivism still continues in uh, throughout the African continent, particularly by European and other Western countries. A searing expose of the global web of traders, bankers, middlemen, despots and corporate raiders that is pillaging Africa's vast national wealth. From the killing fields of Congo to the crude, slick streets of Nigeria, a great endowment of oil, diamonds, copper, iron, gold and Colton has become a curse that condemns millions to poverty. Um, Congo, again, is another country that is currently dealing with conflict. I will leave more information in the description. Um, but lithium and mining and rare earth metals make all of this even more uh, important now than perhaps was known at the time that this book was written. Those are the 24 books that I hope to read by the end of 2024. Um, I will make a big list very front and centre for me again so that I can keep to it because that is what I haven't done before. This is the 20, my 2023 list is the best I've ever done with any of these lists so definitely keeping it something that I see you know at least once a week is um, making me much better at doing actually doing it uh, than I have been in the past and doing it digitally not physically I'm very much a digital person please let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these and enjoyed them any books that you're planning to read next year if you are new here my name is Roisin I put out new videos twice a week so I will see you again very soon please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe and thank you very much for watching